that actually the fighting that the firms do is only a very small part of what they're about. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. My name is Nick. Our guest this episode is Jeff Pearson. He's a football slash soccer researcher who started his research by infiltrating some of these groups. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. The term that I always hear is football soccer hooligan. Does that still apply or is that kind of like a media term that was come up with? I mean, it's a, it's a term that was created by the media in um, some time around the late 1950s and is increasingly or was increasingly then used pretty much across the world to refer to lots of different types of misbehaviour by football fans. So it could refer to vandalism, disorder, antisocial behaviour, rioting in stadiums, mass disorder or serious organised gang violence between different groups of, of crowds. So it was always a very imprecise um, label. Is a hooligan the same as a firm or is that something different? So a firm is a term that's used to refer to a gang of fans of a particular team that gather together with the intention of engaging in violence, usually against um, a rival firm supporting a different team. So if you define a hooligan as being somebody, you could define a hooligan as being somebody that was a member of a, um, of a firm, um, and a firm would be made up of hooligans if you were using the term in that way. Kind of sounds like a hooligan is somebody that might just be making trouble a firm is someone that's there deliberately to cause trouble and to go after the other team or the other team's fans. Is that a fair assessment or not quite? Well, I mean, a firm is a group and it's a group that have the intention of confronting a rival group of the same mind. So they're not just going to go after other fans of other of another team. They are looking specifically to confront a rival firm it's all about reputation and ultimately if you're a firm that attacks ordinary fans of another team your reputation is damaged it's not enhanced where did this kind of all start from is is there a point where you can point to and say okay this is where we have the modern quote unquote hooligan slash firm like where did this come from it's really difficult to, to answer that question. I mean, ultimately, we, there has been violence and disorder associated with live football matches since the birth of the professional game in the 19th century. All the types of misbehaviour that are reported, you can find back in newspapers going back to the, um, to the 19th century. So the types of misbehaviour have, have always been there. People have always been, fans have always been fighting with each other at, at football. Uh, on occasion. Um, the type of organised football violence that we see between groups, we tend to think of when that developed as being um, in the 1980s in particular, when we started to move away from the mass disorder that we saw particularly in the UK in the 1960s and 1970s. The 1980s, in contrast, are seeing as being the birth of the, the firms when smaller groups looked to engage in more, I guess, precise violence against the specific type of other fans rather than that sort of mass disorder, vandalism, antisocial behaviour that we'd previously seen. But there would have always been groups of fans looking to fight rival groups of fans going back from the birth of the games, it wasn't like there was a, a start point. Was there a reason it kind of picked up in the 1980s or was this just kind of a cultural thing that just happened? Nobody knows is the answer. And anybody tells you that they do know is, is lying because there's a number of different factors in play. One of those factors is that the um, if we look at the increase in football disorder in Europe uh, in, the, uh, in the late 1950s through to the 1960s. What we're seeing is the baby boomer generation combined with the fact that people started having weekends. Um, so the weekend entertainment culture started to appear. We started to see disorder from teenagers of that baby boomer generation 
that was associated with football, but also with music. So we have the mods and the rockers, for example, fashion, we have the teddy boys. Um, so all this type of, of misbehaviour started really with that generation. What happened in the 1980s is, of course, these people have grown up a bit. They've got a bit more money. They're a little bit less interested in smashing up um, railway carriages, for example, and spraying graffiti. But for some of them, they got the excitement of the fighting at football. And actually, they wanted to continue that without the other stuff. So I think one explanation for what happened is that essentially those people grew up. A lot of them would stop being engaged in that kind of lower level misbehaviour, but those that hung around wanted to retain the, the violent aspect of it. Another explanation is that the police just got better at preventing that kind of mass violence, became more difficult to engage in that kind of mass disorder because stadiums started to be redeveloped, um, football policing operations started to change, um, and fans started to be sent to prison for relatively minor incidents of of violence. So ultimately, if you wanted to have a fight at football, you had to be a little bit more organized um, if your day wasn't going to be ruined. Here in the States, we have organized crime, right? Did the firms rise to that level of organized crime or is it not quite there? When we talk about organized football violence, we generally talk about groups that gather together before a match. And I'm talking about in, in the UK talk about groups that gather together before the match with the intention that they may get involved in violence on the way to or the way from the, the match. And they'll put themselves, this group, in positions where that violence may occur. So, for example, they will they will take over a, a pub of a rival firm as a challenge, or they will walk, try to march past that rival firm's pub. Um, and it may be that they even send a text message to basically say, oh, we've just arrived, we're walking up your street. So there may be that level of organisation. But in the UK, that tends to be where it stops. We don't tend to get fans that will say, look, we're going to have a fight on this car park at this time on this day. And of course, the fans could do the, the you know, the firms could do that now if they wanted. And in other countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, they do that quite regularly. So they will say, right, well, hang on a minute. We're a firm of, I don't know, Spartak Moscow. We want to have a fight with the firm of Locomotive Moscow. We're going to fight on a non-match day in this car park at midnight because we know the police aren't going to be there. If you really were interested in fighting, that's what you'd do. And that's what some of the Eastern European firms do. In the UK, it's exceptionally rare that you would see that. Really, really rare. Kind of sounds like the difference between starting trouble and looking for trouble. Yes, I think that's I think that's a good assessment. How does like the scene in the United Kingdom compare to other parts of Europe? Is UK the most organized and violent, or like where where do different areas kind of rank on the scale? So the UK got the reputation as being the home of football hooliganism in the in the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties. Prior to that, it had always been assumed that it was the, the Latin Americans and the Southern Europeans that were the real firebrands. And actually, UK fans were incredibly civilised. Um, then sort of in the 70s and 80s, it was the UK that got that reputation. Um, it's not been the case that the UK is a home of hooliganism or that UK football fans are more violent than other fans for a long time now. Certainly not for any point this century. Um, and now much more serious violence takes place in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe, in Southern Europe. Um, so, you know, Poland, Hungary, Russia, um, Belgium, Holland, um, Italy, um, increasingly France, all have much more serious problems in the UK. When we talk about like the level of violence, are we talking about just people throwing hands? weapons involved how bad does it get what's normal generally generally it tends to be fists and feet and things that come to hand rather than going with knives or with batons um you know there are if you go to italy for example knives have always been more of a part of that ultra culture than you have elsewhere in europe 
and there were particular forms of essential punishment by knives that were designed to be non-fatal but humiliating that were utilised in the in the 1980s and 1990s, particularly by some Italian ultra groups. But generally, it is hands and feet because generally, football fans don't want to kill other football fans, um, uh, not least because you get sent to prison for it. I guess what's the point? What's the point in, in engagement in in football violence? Well, um, there's a number of different explanations. There isn't one simple explanation because ultimately people, even people that engage in football violence don't engage in football violence all the time at every match. That's the first thing to understand. The vast bulk of matches take place perfectly peacefully. So you will have groups that want to engage in violence simply because they enjoy what it delivers to them personally. And that may be a psychological buzz or it may be social currency, maybe individual reputation in their locality or in their fan group. Or it may be that they feel that that is the way that they need to represent their locality or represent their particular club. So there are individual reasons why people engage in that. But yeah, the vast bulk of, of major football disorders, so those sort of major riots that we see from time to time, are almost always caused by a breakdown in crowd management. Okay, it's that the police have done something wrong. They've made a mistake or the crowd security at the stadium have done something wrong. And that has essentially caused a minor incident of disorder or violence to exacerbate, which draws in fans who didn't have that predisposition to violence, that weren't there to fight, but suddenly feel like they are under attack. But yeah, the vast bulk of, of major football disorder, so those sort of major riots that we see from time to time, are almost always caused by a breakdown in crowd management. Okay, it's that the police have done something wrong. They've made a mistake or the crowd security at the stadium have done something wrong. And that has essentially caused a minor incident of disorder or violence to exacerbate, which draws in fans who didn't have that predisposition to violence that weren't there to fight but suddenly feel like they are under attack and that it is justified for them to fight back and that's when we see major instances of disorder occur the little football firms themselves that have that predisposition don't usually have the power to cause riots i don't want to put words in your mouth necessarily but i believe the phrase it was like okay so if the police have essentially made a mistake and that is what kind of turns a ma minor incident into a major one what are those mistakes that they usually make typically those mistakes involve not engaging with the crowd while it is peaceful so if you've got a peaceful crowd particularly if they're drinking um, all the crowd management theory tells us that that is the time that police officers should be talking to the crowd and engaging with the crowd, assessing the mood of the crowd, assessing where potential dangers occur, and looking to protect that crowd from attacks from outside. Um, that's an opportunity for the police force and the police officers to basically gain legitimacy among those crowds, to try and um, be seen as facilitating their legitimate objectives. And what that means is that if problems occur later in the day, those police officers have currency to be able to say to the fans, you stop doing that, or can you please move in this direction? Okay, because they've gained that level of trust in the scene as being legitimate. So the first mistake that a lot of forces make is not being proactive and not engaging in what we call dialogue policing. The second problem um, which leads to disorder caused by police is when the police use coercive force in an indiscriminate and disproportionate manner, which basically means that people that haven't done anything wrong suddenly find themselves being pushed around, being baton charged, being in a cloud of tear gas, and they've done nothing wrong. And then those fans, some of them may respond, for example, by throwing a bottle of beer that they're drinking back at the police. So those are the two. First, there's a failure to do something. And secondly, there is doing something indiscriminately and disproportionately. And those two factors of poor policing map into each other. 
because if you aren't engaged in the crowd and you don't have that intelligence and that legitimacy in the crowd, then it's much more likely that you are going to see an overwhelming response that is disproportionate, coercive and violent as being legitimate. Underreaction and then overreaction. So how did now now how did you start studying this? Um, I was I was always interested in in football crowds. I always found them fascinating. I I loved the the noise that a crowd made. I loved the way that crowds moved. I loved the surges that you had on football terraces. Going back from being a kid in the in the nineteen eighties, so I always wanted to do something which kept me engaged in football crowds, and I wanted to learn more about them. Um, and you know, football hooliganism was seen as being a major social issue around the late 1980s. But at the same time, fans were seen as legitimate targets for the police, and I felt that was unfair. And then we saw what happened at Hillsborough in 1989, when 97 football fans were essentially killed by poor policing. Um, and I felt it was something that I wanted to try and change if I could. Um, so I did a, did a PhD in the, in the mid-1990s, looking at how the law and policing and football crowds interacted and what were the best methods for successfully regulating football crowds. But you observed from the inside, right? You were in, were you in a firm or? So I, um, the method that I chose to investigate football crowd behavior and football crowd regulation was to go covertly undercover inside football crowds where my new issues occurred. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to say I infiltrated a firm because ultimately when I started off with um, fans of Blackpool Football Club and then started following England abroad, there wasn't a firm to infiltrate. The disorder that we were seeing was disorder that was largely the result of um, breakdowns in in public order and, and, and safety management. Um, so it was very spontaneous disorder that was occurring. So while I was in those crowds and the fans didn't know I was a researcher and the police certainly didn't know I was a researcher, um, I wouldn't, I would never go as far as saying I infiltrated organized football firms because because that's what I didn't do. What was that kind of experience like? Uh, well, it was it was it was fascinating. It was exciting. It was occasionally scary, but mostly the the disorder and violence that you saw was brief. There were not many people involved. It was fairly easy to stick, stay away from. The biggest danger, personally, was always posed by the police, particularly away from the UK. When I went to places like. Italy or France with English football teams. Um, we were subject to uh, very aggressive, violent policing. That was always the, the, the biggest risk and where I felt the most uncomfortable. Now, did you have to kind of do anything to be a part of that crowd or just kind of go along with the crowd? Mostly, I could just hang around in the crowd and act as they did, which was almost always in a non-violent manner. There were occasions during my early research where I had to commit very minor criminal offences, which I've talked about and published about, for example, running on a football pitch, which is a criminal offence in, in the UK, or being drunk inside a football stadium. Um, and if I didn't do that, then I would basically be excluded from the group I was, I was researching. But mostly, you know, the, the amount of the amount of actual fights I ended up in and the amount of times I actually had to throw a punch in self-defense was, you know, I could count on on the fingers of one hand in 25 years of doing this work. As a person, you know, who lives in the United States, the thing that I I guess I struggle to kind of understand about it, right, is it like how bad is it? I guess. I mean, are people going to the matches and they're just like, oh, you got to watch out. I hope nothing happens. Or is this really kind of an isolated thing that happens amongst small certain groups? It's the latter. It's pretty much something you need to look for. Certainly domestically. If you go to your average 
a Premier League game in, in England, you know, you're really, really unlucky if you see a violent incident. Um, and likewise, people that do want to get involved in fights, actually, it's quite difficult to go and look for that violence and to find that violence. And, um, and they, they spend a lot of their time, they, the firms that are active, just being marched around by the, the football police in, in England who generally have good control of those small groups that are looking to engage in, in violence. So incidents do occur, but, you know, quite unlucky if you, um, if you find yourself involved and generally you know where to avoid and what behaviours to avoid doing if you want to avoid it. I'm a big numbers person and say on a scale of one to 10, if one is the most peaceful community of happy fans that you could imagine and 10 is the 1980s, like where do you think we are currently on that scale? Well, maybe three. That's like it's not going to happen to you, but you knew you know that you have to be aware that it is there. Yeah, and I think the the to put it in its to put it in its context, I think pre lockdown we were a two, so there has been a post lockdown increase. Do you think that does that mean that is that a trend where we're going to be going back up, or is that kind of just like all right, the pandemic is lifting for the most part at least socially in terms of social gathering and this is a temporary thing or do you think okay we're ramping back up here so i think it's a if we keep doing what we've been doing particularly i'm talking from the uk here if we keep doing what we're doing in terms of good crowd management i think it's just a blip um i think um the the self-regulation and self-policing among fan groups will re-establish itself and I think the good football policing operations will also reestablish themselves and things will calm down. The risk is that it's seen by the authorities as being a trend and it's seen that the previous things we were doing weren't working and that therefore we need to up the stakes in terms of, for example, the number of police officers, the aggression of those police officers. And if we do that, then the risk is that you're going to make the situation worse. So it has the potential to get worse. I don't think we will ever go back to where we were in the 1970s or 1980s because I think things are just so much better now in terms of stadium infrastructure, legal infrastructure and expertise of, of, of police officers. But there is a risk that some police forces will essentially panic and they'll make things worse. The good football policing operations I think we'll get this under control. And actually, there's all, at the moment, there's evidence that things are already starting to come under control. Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Uh, yes. When we look at football firms, who's kind of has the most dangerous reputation now? Who was always the one that, who's kind of like the the most of all time, I guess? Um. Well, I mean, look, you, if Millwall play in a high risk match, they will always bring a group of people that are up for a fight every time. Um, they are, they are an away group that if confronted, you know, some of them will always fight back. And that has always been the case. It's established in the, in the culture. They, they, they're very cohesive units. Um, but I wouldn't want, people to think that Millwall were a team that went and attacked people randomly because they don't. But, you know, Millwall always have that reputation. Then you have fan groups that always take large numbers of fans that make themselves heard and pose very serious crowd management challenges, should we say. Um, and in that you would include um, Leeds United and Manchester United always um and then you've got groups in between you know um i mean birmingham have always had a bit of a reputation aston villa pose crowd management problems when they when they when they attend um so there's 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 quite a there's quite a lot of all of the premier league clubs probably with the exception of liverpool have a a firm of some sort 
but they tend to be quite small um, and don't tend to cause problems frequently. If there was one that you would say like of all time, like, oh, they were, they were a problem. Um, I mean, in the in the nineteen seventies, you would always say it was Manchester United that were the that were the were the worst team in terms of crowd disorder. In the nineteen eighties, you might say, well, perhaps it was Chelsea or West Ham, um, and more recently, you might say it's, it's it's some of those more smaller firms like like Millwall that that caused the more problems. So there hasn't been a a single one that has always been up there at the top. Is it usually worse when you're talking about violence when a UK team is playing a UK team or when country X is playing country Y? Um, as, a, as a general rule, it's always worth, worse domestically because these are because when problems occur domestically, those two teams may be playing each other four months down the line or that time next season. So you have that historical rivalry that develops so if for example you have a situation where the firm gets it wrong and attacks a group of innocent supporters of a rival team then you've got to worry about what retribution there will be for that later on whereas of course when teams from different countries play each other they may not play each other again for another 30 years so as a general rule it tends to be domestic um, rivalries that, that cause a lot of problems is there a sense of reputation amongst the firms themselves? Yeah, I mean, reputation is really important. And it's not just reputation between the firms, it's reputation between the team supporters. Because even if you don't want, if you if you travel regularly away from home, particularly if you're a, a young male, actually a lot of the supporters that we speak to have a pride in their firm being active and having a good reputation, even if they are completely nonviolent individuals themselves. So the reputation matters beyond just the individual firms. But ultimately, particularly in the UK, um, you know, the actual levels of interpersonal violence and organised violence are very low. And if you're a firm that's gone up against another firm and you've taken an absolute battering, it's equally likely that actually you're not going to show up ever again because you don't want another kicking. Um it's a bit different when we move to sort of Eastern Europe and, and, and some of the, these, these firms are more organised, more serious, more cohesive and generally bigger, then you might get that, um, you know, the, the, the retribution aspect. But um, the easy answer to that question is reputation is very important and maintaining your reputation, if you can, is important. But if you can't realistically maintain your reputation, fans... Generally, uh, members of firms don't go in for an absolute kicking if they can help it. So people like fans do take a certain pride in it, even if they're not participating. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And and football fans will chant songs about football violence, even though they've never been involved in it themselves. What's a song about football violence? So, for example, Manchester United fans um, will sing a song um, which goes, we fought in France, we fought in Spain, we fought in the sun and we fought in the rain. We took the cop and Chelsea too, but what we like most is kicking a blue. By blue, you mean a Manchester City fan. These fans singing it have never kicked a Manchester City fan in the head, but that's what they're singing about. Everybody just wants to be part of something at the end of the day, right? You just want to, you just want to say you were there too. Um, do any of the firms engage in organised crime outside of football i think it's more the case that people that are involved in organized crime away from football may also be involved in football. and essentially if you're a if you're a drug lord with absolutely loads of money to spend then traveling around around the world watching your team is is something you might want to spend your your match on if you're a particularly violent individual you know, the chances are you're going to get involved in a scrap at a game at some point. So um, so there are overlaps between organised crime and the firms. And uh, if we go to, again, Southern and Eastern Europe and, and South America, you tend to see a lot of overlaps between things like drug dealing um, and, and, those, and those firms and also uh, corruption and, and local authorities and, and local governments. So there are those overlaps, but it's not the case 
that it's like the firm spread out into other types of misbehaviour. It, it's more the other way around, that involvement in football violence is something that, that overlaps with and can be an outcome of the other form of criminality and corruption. That makes sense, right? I guess if like I was involved in narcotics or robbery or burglary, being a part of a firm would be a pretty easy hobby. And it's and it's and it's social it's social currency as well. If you have a reputation of being a a hard football hooligan, okay, that helps you out in you know if you're if you're selling or buying drugs off somebody, it means that they're much less likely to cross you. If you need to get into a certain nightclub and you, you've got a reputation as get fighting at football, again, it's much more likely to be helpful. We don't we shouldn't look at this as being mindless violence. It is sometimes very very valuable for those people that need to use physical force in the course of their uh, criminal activities. Now, did you get a reputation when you were infiltrating? No, a very, very, very brief and completely undeserved one. But, um, you know, I was, I, was, I was 21 when I started this and I couldn't fight my way out of a paper sack. Best movie about this culture? That's an easy, that's a very easy question. The best movie about football violence is ID with Reese Dinsdale because, the, because that's the only movie that gets the camaraderie and the humour about football violence. That actually the fighting that the firms do is only a very small part of what they're about. It's about the camaraderie, it's about the expression of identity, it's about representing your locality, and it's about humour, funny things happening. An ID is the only film that nails that. Which one makes your eye twitch? Like, oh, it's absolutely not. Oh, God, I can't, I can't watch most of them. I can't. I mean, Green Street. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the idea that what's-his-face, the Hobbit from The Lord of the Rings, would be involved in that kind of activity. Elijah Wood, is it? Um, is just laughable. At what I guess what about it? What makes it so because he's not a big physically imposing person, or what what makes it kind of like no? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean the the fact that there's nothing to suggest he's 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 capable of fighting, and there's there's nothing to suggest that he's actually connected with what the firms are doing. And as I say, that's why ID is such so much a better film. It explains ID why people might get involved in the fight, which you know those films like Green Street just just never did. It was just such an abstract concept. Um, whereas actually, when you go to the football, even if you don't want to fight yourselves, you can see why people would want to and why they would get involved in that. Um, what do you think of like the World Cup? Is the World Cup usually a place for this, or like, no, not no. really? No, the, the 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 firms never travel as firms to World World Cups. So the Italian ultras don't go. the The hooligans in Belgium and Holland don't go. The some of the English lads will go, but they won't go to fight. They won't go either to fight with each other or to fight the police or the the, the local groups. Um, occasionally, there has been disorder at the European Football Championships. Um, for example, in Marseille in 2016. But generally, the World Cups, you don't tend to get that violence. If disorder occurs, it tends to be because the police have messed up, um, usually involving England firms. Uh, but it's not an occasion where the firms look to fight. Um, there won't be any organised violence in Qatar. To Okay, if you could change your name, what would you change your first name to? Like, have you thought about this at all? No, I haven't. Uh, I, I haven't thought about it, but it's a pretty simple answer. I would just want my first name to be like its own, you know, something. You know, like how The Rock is The Rock. Like, I, I would want a strong just f like first name to where I wouldn't need any other like, I wouldn't need a middle name. I wouldn't need a last name. You would just know me as, like, Brian. But that's way too common of a name. <laughs> You've got to have a distinct name, like The Rock, Shakira, yeah. Madonna. Shaq. 
Yeah, those are all distinct names. Like nobody's just Brian. There's nobody who's on a first name basis that somebody's like, hey, look, there's Todd. Would you really choose the name Brian? No, but I mean, I I, I don't know what like name I would choose, but it would be, you know, it'd be something to where I was only identified as that name. I could see you as a Brian and a Todd, actually. Steve, okay. I could see you as a Steve. Um, I, Phil, I, I, I could I, actually I, see you as a Phil, too. Wow. So all basic white guy names. Okay. Yeah, pretty much basic white guy <laughs> names. Like yeah. boring names. Basic boring white guy names. Bob. I've gotten, uh, I've actually gotten Dwayne before. No, I could see you as a Wayne, though. Jesus Christ. Wayne, Jesus. Bob, Cameron, Charlie. Yeah, basically all boring, generic white guy names. Well, I mean, it, it's true, though. I mean, I, I guess as much as I don't want to admit it, uh, I guess it's true. I, You know, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I, I've always kind of thought if your name wasn't Nick that Paul would fit you. Hmm, I could see that a little bit. Yeah, I think you'd be a good Paul. Um, for some reason, I think Ewan. I don't know why, but like you kind of have a Ewan McGregor kind of uh, persona to you. My name would be, okay, correct me if I'm wrong here on this one. My name would be generic, but less generic than your name if it was changed. Yeah, I mean, you would still be a yeah, you'd still have a generic name, but you'd be like a class above me on genericness. I think slightly more distinctive. Paul is a little bit like you don't see a lot of Pauls. You see a lot of Brian's. A lot of Brian's. A lot of Brian's. Yeah, but I wouldn't be an exotic name. I wouldn't be like Aster, Crickson. Yeah, Jackson. I wouldn't be one of those. I would be like, oh yeah, that I forgot that's a name. Or, you know, like maybe even a Cody. I could see you maybe as a Cody, too. I could I see Cody why. as well. Yeah. Yeah, like a, you know, hipster, I can't leave my, you know, my childhood behind kind of name. That would, that's what would suit you. I don't think anybody should leave their childhood behind. I think you should be a child all your life. There's a natural curiosity and excitement about the world that I think the child, children retain that people that, you know, that children have that adults should retain. I think when you use lose that childlike qualities about yourself you kind of lose a little bit of the world all right i was giving it time to go to a break there because i was couldn't couldn't have said been said any better than what you just said it Stay okay let's child. go into your sh- dream for the stars all right dream for the stars. uh you, here are some shout outs uh we're gonna start with the easy one i picked out uh today in terms of names uh samuel law uh we'll go on to Devin j jake guider Kimmy Liani, Gideon Lorit, Valerie Apisala, Mark Knight, Anna Shockley, Aria Malise, and Grant Neary. You all get the uh, the special shout outs of the week. So congratulations to you all, you all. Which one of us do you think is more of a Kirk? Me, because I, I feel like a Kirk is a very bland name, whether you're white, black, whatever. I just feel like it's a very, like, it's indicative of the person. Kirk is probably an accountant. <laughs> but he's yeah. the manager. He's the he's in charge he's... of the accounting department, or at least on his way. He's on his way up if his name is Kirk. Hi. I'm here to speak to somebody. Yeah, we'll send you right over to Kirk. He's just sitting right there. Yeah, that sounds about right. I do find it fascinating how much of your life, your name, your genetics, all your environment that you're born into, how much of your life is basically completely decided for you before you even have a conscious thought? Oof. I mean, see, now 90%? you're getting deep. Now I'm going to say deep. I'm going to go ahead and say that 90 to 95% of your life is basically laid out for you because of your genetics, the environment you're born into, your name, and what you look like before you even have a chance to essentially 
chart your own destiny in any way. Your life is basically laid out for you. I, I don't know if I would go as that high, but I, I would say seventy, at least 75% of your life is mapped out for you. Before like you even are conscious of making any decision that can change. Before you have yeah. even the ability to change it, your life you is know, set in stone. I, I'll go this far as saying... Uh, and, and I'm not getting political here, so no one think I am, but I would say the moment you're conceived that, you know, when, once, once you're given the chromosomes and everything, you are, uh, you are already on your way to basically having at least 75% of your life already decided for you. I don't want to offend anybody here, but how much of, of life and lineage and, and family trees are just basically, you know, uh, one stops and then it starts all over again. You know, you know what I mean? Like our parents, their parents, uh, their parents, parents, you can pretty much just go down the line and go, yep, I can probably tell you what John's going to be like, even though he's a year old. I can tell you probably what, you know, where he's going to be when he's 35, what he's going to be into in his teenage years. Um, and I, I feel like that's pretty reminiscent of, uh, of most people. There are, there are, occasions right where somebody defies the norm but i would i would say that's like your five percent i think the only real question is are you going to be more like your mom or your dad i don't look at this as being depressing i actually think it's the exact opposite of depressing that in the sense that whatever you are right now in life that is the thing that you are always going to be and whatever decisions that you made it wasn't ever going to change that you are always going to be in this position. So just enjoy life. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, I, and so for those of you who don't know, know this, we don't really script things on our part of the show. Uh, it's so funny you ask me this because I literally had a conversation with my wife uh, just this morning about this very topic. If you look at it that way, it's almost like you, you have a set path and then whether you believe in God or whatever, Something tries to throw a couple of curveballs at you and either you hit them and you knock the shit out of the park and you go down that path or you miss them and you keep going down the path you're on like tragedy, a lucky break, you know, something like nobody can, you know, I'm on the path I'm on, which you could probably have predicted since I was five. But if I hit the lottery tomorrow and become a billionaire, like that's something you can't expect, but I'm one out of, you know, Seven billion people. So didn't that dude? Didn't somebody win two billion dollars? They did. Yeah. Damn. Just yeah, imagine nice. that. Like one day, the next day, you're a billionaire. If I was to hit like a Powerball for nine hundred million dollars, I'm not sure I'd be able to take that. I think my heart would stop. God, I wonder if there's ever been anybody that like won Powerball or won a big lottery and then had a heart attack and died and couldn't claim it. I, I'm going to say no because suck. usually the machine like or the computers pick up that all the numbers have been, uh, you know, uh, picked or whatever. But like, how are they supposed to know back in the 70s and 80s for those lotto pots? I mean, I don't think they were I don't think they were computerized like they were now or are now. You know, just sitting at home, seeing the numbers come across, and next thing you know, you're dead <laughs> because you're in such shock. Um, the the largest unclaimed lottery ticket that was never claimed but someone did win was $77 million. So somebody won $77 million and never claimed it. Lost ticket or dead, basically. I just... But if you lost the ticket, you'd never know what the numbers were. I wonder if they would accept a picture. Like, I'd have lost my ticket, but I took a picture of it. Mm -mm. <laughs> God, no, could they're... you imagine that? What are your numbers? Let me check my phone. Where's the ticket? Fuck! I guarantee you that, uh, like, say you said you threw your ticket away, they probably would hire people to go through the garbage to try to prove that you had that ticket. They're not just going to give you the prize based on, you know, a photo or hearsay. Like, they're going to make or try to find actual physical evidence. You know what I mean? Here's the other thing. What if you lost the ticket? You know you lost the ticket, but you paid people to find the ticket. They then found the ticket and cashed it in themselves. Oh, Could you then prove that it was... Then what happens? 
Yeah, you don't get receipts with lotto purchases or, or Powerball tickets. So, yeah, at that point, it's yeah, you're you're. <laughs> I man, that's a good turn. I didn't think about that. Um, what would happen? Like, well, I'm just going to turn in the ticket myself, and you could claim it anonymously. But would you have to be pretty low of a person to do that? Say you do get hired, and you find it, and then you take it. I mean, that I, I don't know. I wouldn't have any problem with it. We're talking about million, tens of millions of dollars, billion of dollars. We have no problem with that. Because you're looking at it the wrong way. Like, are you doing something pretty terrible? Yeah, but you have just set up your family for massive generational wealth. Man. Uh, all right. A uh, couple of bangers for you. Uh, it is the holiday season, right? We're officially there. Um, it's a pretty simple question. Uh, is it, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a word that means the most terrible idea ever to play Christmas music November 1st until obviously the day after Christmas. Normally my policy is that Christmas begins the weekend of Thanksgiving. You have Thanksgiving, you do the Black Friday thing. I'm not saying that you go shopping. No, you you have Thanksgiving and then you can put your lights up and start to do the Christmas thing. It has to wait until Friday. This year for some reason is different and I've noticed this in my neighborhood. We put our lights up already. And a lot of other people have put their lights up. It's Christmas, man. We're going <laughs> – Thanksgiving this year is getting skipped, and we're going straight to Christmas. I, I agree with you on the lights and, and things. I, I actually just took my Halloween ones down, so there's that. But in Michigan, we had a crazy uh, – at least in southeastern Michigan, it was like 75 degrees last week in November. It's going to snow tomorrow. We're supposed to get four inches uh, in, in the middle of the week, but it's fine. Uh, so a lot of people were out there trying to beat the beat the cold snap, and here I am. I'll be out there freezing my fingers off after Thanksgiving. Your wife going to get two more inches than she usually does? <laughs> <laughs> for the, once again, for those of you who for those of you who will never see this video, Nick, like I could tell he was just thinking something, and then he just let it go. So. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of it. Pretty anyways, we'll it. Okay. we'll move on. Uh, what what is the uh, the lesser juice here? Apple juice, orange juice, or cranberry juice? I have a problem with juice as a whole. I oh think that juice God. is one of the stupidest inventions that we have ever come with in our, come up with in our society. There is no reason for juice. Juice juice should be gotten rid of. We don't need it at all it's just a waste so wait what were the options though <laughs> i'm anti-juice juice you are i mean you are anti-juice anti -juice. I'm... except for pineapple juice and That's then okay. you go with the most obscure random juice to say is good right because it has to be a juice of a fruit that like there has to be some kind of incentive to have juice right you can have apple juice or you could eat this apple you're paying more for the apple no. juice, and it's not as good for the body, right? The apple, only but, juice is like, oh, well, you know, a pineapple is a pain in the ass. Mango but, juice, okay. Apple juice is a proven diuretic. And but why would apple juice be better for you than apples? I don't know, because it breaks down in the body faster? I, I, I have no idea, but apple juice, and, and I could be wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong. Helps your urinary tract, your you know your digestive system. As we're an apple, if you eat it, obviously your digestive system has to work twice as harder than if you just drink apple juice. I'm just saying it's much better to eat the fruit. It fills you up, and it's probably cheaper. I will say it's better for you. Uh, it's probably cheaper. But juice, I mean, I, I don't even know why I'm defending this. Juice is amazing. Juice is, it's stupid. I am anti juice. Anti juice. What were your what were the choices that you had anyway? Sorry. Apple, uh, orange, or cranberry. Well, cranberry is terrible. Cranberry juice should be only in limited limited doses. Like if you can drink like a twelve ounce glass of cranberry juice, I don't know what's going on there. Orange juice is probably the best, followed by apple, then cranberry. No one really likes cranberries. Out of the mainstream juices, it is the best medically for you if you're trying to 
be healthy. I'm just not a shale for the juice lobby like you are. You are not. Yeah, I, I was kind of spray. Sub- Change your name to Ocean Spray then. <laughs> I, I, I'm. Sub- I mean, I was not expecting you to go off why there would, on that. Why would cranberry juice be better for you than cran apple? You can have two <laughs> birds with one stone then. <laughs> I mean, that's just. Let's just move on. I, I don't know. <laughs> Let, let's see, let's see what people want us to talk about. Uh, all right. So the choices this week: uh, the University of Michigan, Nebraska football game nut shot. The World Cup, which starts on Sunday, which got no votes. Uh, the plane that, for some reason, is nicknamed the Beluga because it looks like a beluga whale, which is just weird. Uh, or NFL quarterbacks as women, uh, <laughs> which was hilarious. Uh, but the winner, uh, the University of Michigan, Nebraska, nutshot. So... Nick, I presume you haven't seen it. No. So uh, I don't really I know want to see doesn't... people get hit in the nuts. Let me. Uh, Actually, I'm going to drop my mic for a second fun. so I can hold my phone up, but I'm going to show you the video here. Okay. Okay. I mean, I could just look it up, but it's fine. I'm watching you operate. You got glare. Can't see anything. Oh. Can't see anything. Literally. Here. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay, so basically this guy tries to hurdle one football player. The other football player puts his head up, hits him directly in the genital region, and then propels him in the air. I mean, that's the look, I, at no point will I ever not laugh at a nut shot. <laughs> I mean, I farts I had a... and nut shots are the two things that will always be funny. I so that was I have a couple of follow up questions. That was one was are nut shots never not funny? They're never funny when they happen to you because they do hurt, but they are always inherently funny. So then I follow up with, uh, obviously, um, I've never been hit in the nuts by a player with a football helmet. Uh, what What is the worst nut shot you've ever received? Oh, I can't think of... Well... For our female audience, the worst nut shot is when you get a ricochet of some kind. You've got three things down there, right? You got the twig and you got the two berries. And if any of them kind of go into a domino effect where one hits the other hits the other, <laughs> that is going to be the worst type. So any kind of ricochet where you're like, oh, if it gets this one, it gets that one. I know of a traumatizing event from my childhood, though, in which I was still too young to understand fully, like, what was involved. And I have my uncle, who I just reared back and kicked from behind right there while a bunch of us were wrestling. And I still feel sorry about it to this day. (laughs) Like, I still feel bad. Like, oh, man. Like, one of those things where you remember you doing that and you feel ashamed to your core. Like, oh. (laughs) Sorry, Uncle Whitney. Sorry about okay. that. He went on to have kids after that, so it must have not been that bad. But he was <laughs> mad, and he was not, he's not an angry man. Okay. All right. Do you have one that was just really bad? I have a couple. Um, one, the most recent one was uh, in Orlando. Uh, some friends and I had had a night out, and we stopped at uh, Gringo's uh, Tacos and Burritos, which is by far the best uh, Mexican restaurant in orlando and i will fight anyone on that so well come at you're me. wrong because they closed they did i don't know i just assumed yeah i don't think they did i just looked up their menu like oh actually they have ago. multiple locations anyways so we're going back to my uh my condo or whatever and we're in the elevator and uh i go to step out of the elevator like you know i was last to come out one of my friends thought it'd be funny to nut check me but, like, it wasn't, like, just a, a brief, you know, like, flick of the hand. Like, I'm pretty sure he punched me right in the dick. And I, I fell back into the elevator, dropped my food all over the floor, and then the door <laughs> shut, and I went back down to the lobby. So when the – and it and mind you, it's, like, 2.30 in the morning. There shouldn't be anyone on the elevators. And, of course, the door opens, and there's, like, a couple waiting to get on. And there's me on the floor with my spilled food. <laughs> And they, they actually, like, the the door shut, and I pressed the button. They wouldn't even get on. And I probably wouldn't get on either if I saw me laying there. 
Um, God, that's a good that, one. That's really funny. See, at no time are they not funny. Yeah, that, and the that strength, was one... the power behind the nut shot does not necessarily dictate the pain. It can uh, be no. light. If somebody catches you right, ooh. The the other the other one that I remember from my adult my adulthood pretty gnarly was we we're playing basketball and I wasn't looking and someone passed the ball to me and just I mean it just <laughs> like it didn't it, it didn't get you know like I didn't feel the twig. <gasps> oh man. But it like it hit kind of what you said, it was like a ricochet. Like one berry went into another berry and then the twig got involved and That's uh the worst. Yeah, I was um I was really hurting after that. I I've, I've never thrown up from something like that, but I was like dry heaving because once again you can't explain it. It's like having oh, a I've baby for that. for women, right? Like they you can't really explain the pain or how it feels. Um but I felt like my testicles were like in my throat. Like it I, was terrible. I would say the best way to explain it would be like it's your body letting you know on all levels in terms of pain, queasiness, nausea. Like, do not do that again. Yeah, like, do not. It's like it's <laughs> it's it's a less stinging, painful version of hitting your inner ear with a Q-tip, where it's like, oh, don't do oh. that. I mean, do that is not do that. That's painful for sure. But I, I would say this is worse because I feel like with the 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 ear. It comes and goes rapidly. With with you get a good nut check, like you're down for a couple of minutes at least. Oh, it's five to ten minute experience. Our top five is top five worst team names. It's your number five. <laughs> there are some winners, uh, but here we go. My number five are the Hawaii Rainbow Warriors. But okay, I I don't understand, and this has nothing to do with the LGBTQ plus community. But I, I don't know, is, is Hawaii known for rainbows? Like, why are they the Rainbow Warriors? They, tropical? I, but are, are is tropical weather associated with rainbows? Like, I don't know. I, I think I took a little bit of a different approach. I don't have a problem with names that are different, right? Like the Rainbow Warriors or the Long Beach State Dirtbags. My issue is with teams that are like, it's supposed to be cool. But it's just not like my number five is the Utah Jazz. Like, am I supposed to be excited about jazz? And how lame is Utah that like, what's the most exciting thing we got? Jazz. I I would just like to know, like, I don't know what, like, why? Like, why the jazz, right? I mean, of all things in Utah, you're like, what is a jazz? That's kind of my list. Like, you know, what is a, what is, you know. A jazz. I, well, I it's don't a, get it. It's you know, jazz is a form of music, right? But yeah, like, but I like, don't think of like Memphis jazz. Okay, Utah. Yeah. I don't think that there's a lot of jazz musicians that came from Utah. I'm gonna move on here. Uh, so my number four. Uh, <laughs> oh man, I swear I wrote down some. I found some really good ones. Uh, the Chattanooga Central Purple Pounders. Once again. <laughs> What is a purple pounder? And this is a high school nickname of all things. I think the problem is, is that I think that the ones that you're saying are the worst are ones that I think are kind of awesomely hilarious. Yeah, I mean, they're funny to say, but like, what What if you have, like, what if that was your identity, right? We I'm talked about identities pounder. earlier. Like, from the womb, it's like, little Johnny is going to be a purple pounder in 14 years. Like, what does that even mean? Somebody's like, right? And that is why you should always consult people outside of your bubble in life. Because you might have yeah. this thing that makes perfect sense to you and everybody else would be like, what? <laughs> no, no, here comes the Purple Pounders. My number four is a tie between the Miami Hurricanes and Chicago Fire. Like, we shouldn't be naming teams after disasters. No, absolutely. Not a great idea. I mean, I could add, like, the first, the first one that comes up to my mind is the Colorado Avalanche. Like the Oklahoma City Bombers. Like <laughs> speaking of Utah, here's one in Utah that when I saw this name, I was like, I have no idea why this is a high school nickname. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sorry for calling them out, uh, but it's the Jordan Beat Diggers. 
and it's all one word. Beat diggers is a one word. And apparently uh, it's because of the beet crop around the around Jordan, Utah. But it's like beet diggers? Like My number three is the Cleveland Browns. It's just a terrible name. Like, oh, we're the Browns. I just, they're one of those professional sports franchises that I'm like, what is your mascot, right? Because they, like, it's a dog, it's a dog. But, then they have, but then they have, like, some little elf-looking thing that runs around on the field. Like, I have no idea what you are. Nobody knows what you are. Like, the Browns don't even know what they are. That's why they're so terrible all the time. Chomps and Brownie the Elf. It's like... It's like, God, that's just bad decision on top of bad decision. What's yeah, your number? Uh, what's your number two? Uh, we're heading to Japan for this one. Uh, the Nippon Ham Fighters. Is Once it- again, like, why can't they be the pigs? Why do you like ham doesn't fight? How do they spell it? H A A. Does it mean something else in Japan though, where maybe it's like a poor translation? I I, I don't think so. I mean, I haven't actually looked it up, but I. I mean, their name is 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 obviously Japanese, and then it's ham fighters. So <laughs> I, maybe they fucking hate ham. I, I guess, man. I I join them. I'm I'm there with them. F ham. What happened? It really kind of gives you an idea of like what happened in that place that they're so. I mean, at least the beet diggers. <laughs> you can kind of like okay, well, dig in the beets. But I mean, like okay, so my number five was uh, you know. The Rainbow Warriors from Hawaii. Like, how do you market that to somebody? And I'm not even being funny. It's like, yeah, come to Hawaii where we're tough and, and mean and our football program won three games last year and you're going to be a Rainbow Warrior. Doesn't I mean, seem like much of a warrior. Exactly. My, number, uh, my number two is just Washington in general. Between the Wizards, the Washington football team, the Washington Commanders, <laughs> all of Washington's teams are just terrible names. The Nationals. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, <sighs> I mean, I don't think we need to go into the, what happened with the Washington football team, but, uh, right. you know, they're, they're all terrible. The Capitals are kind of cool. That's about the only one that I would pass or is the That's hockey That's the team. only one that I'm okay with, but like you couldn't keep what their name used to be for the Washington commanders, but you could have come up with anything better than that. Just go anything. with an animal. Any animal is going to be okay. <laughs> as long as it's like you know a, a a normal animal and not like a miniature pig or a you know a ch- i don't even know a chinchilla you've got even a chinchilla i'd be okay with i can't think of a single animal i wouldn't be okay with <laughs> the rats maybe yeah i mean porcupines awesome I mean, you're kind of pandas the spot awesome. here i yeah I, I i don't know uh I don't think I'd want to be like a pig or a cow, anything that signifies big and dumb, a manatee. But only a couple of big and dumb ones. Like the rhinos are cool. Rhinos are yeah, big but, and dumb. But like rhinos are like, you know, they're tough, right? They're might be big and dumb, but they're they're tough animals. Oh, what's your number one? All right, so my number one, and once again, this is a high school team nickname. And really, I'm pointing this one out, but it's really any name that makes fun of or describes, you know, uh, a type of person with a disability or something that is looked down upon society or has been made fun of. Like we said, the Washington Redskins earlier, things like that. So my number one, the Freebird, sorry, the Freebird Midgets. Yeah, you can't. You like you can't. Is that still their name? Yeah, and you like you can't do that apparently, and I'm not being, I'm not being funny here, uh, but I mean like the little people for America have come out asking them to change their name. They apparently had a midget mascot called Marty the Midget, who was taken away like a couple decades ago. But it's like, like what, like what, like who thought that was a good idea to have, you know, a midget mascot. And I'm not saying once again, I'm not saying midgets are bad. I'm 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 pointing out the fact that somewhere in America we think it's okay to nickname a high school the midgets. No. 
professional sports team, you could at least have some level of, I'm not saying agreement, but understanding like, okay, maybe they're not changing it because they just have, they've making so much money off of this, right? Which is basically, I think, what happened in Washington, right? Like he was just making so much money that they weren't going to change it for that. But like with a public high school, like, damn, you got to change that. Right? Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> so I mean, it looks like it, I mean, it's definitely open. About seven hundred kids go there. Uh, free, uh, obviously, it's Freeburg, Illinois, which uh, does not look like it's you know, it, it's not, it's not a like a small city by any by any regards. It's not. It's it's uh, Western Illinois, not too far away from St. Louis, uh, but they are definitely home of the midgets. I'm surprised they haven't changed that. I'm just really surprised they haven't changed it. Uh, my number one is the New York Yankees. Basically named after jerking off. <laughs> that is not accurate at all, but that's fair. I, I, could, I mean, listen, I could see how you could say that, uh, but, I mean, the Yankees come from, like, you know, the Knickerbockers, like the Yankees of the 20s and 30s, and, you know. It's a historical name, I get it, but nowadays it's a terrible name. It is, but it's kind of like the midgets. It might be a terrible name, but you can't go back. Well, actually, well, midgets, you can. <laughs> you probably <laughs> should. Um, but yeah, it's man. Yeah, the Yankees are pretty good. What's your uh, What's in your honorable mention? Well, I'm going to start with this one because you just said jerking it. Uh, but I have the the Hoopiston area corn jerkers. That's another <laughs> high school nickname out of Illinois. What the hell is happening? Happening. In Illinois, man. Um, like, you didn't I have, have to be the, that different. <laughs> I have the UC Santa Cruz banana slugs. Because what the hell is a banana slug? Like It's a type it's a, of it's insect, I believe. Oh, okay there, Jeff Corwin. Um, the Thailand, Thailand Tobacco Monopoly Football Club. <laughs> That's a good one. That's way <laughs> too many syllables. And then uh, the last one I, I, I kind of wrote down here. Uh, and I'm not even sure where this is from, but it's just the polka dots. I don't mind that. Yeah, P-O-C-A some of them would like if it's dots. just different. I but like, I don't mind some of the ones that are like the beat diggers. At least it's different. It's terrible, but at some point, terrible becomes awesome. I mean, that one at least has a backstory that you can get behind. Uh, but still, the beat diggers. I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, I I don't know, man. Good for them. You know, I'm glad I was just a just a normal name growing up there for a, for a mascot or for a for a team name. What were you? Uh the Vikings. I was a Panther, which makes yeah, no you... sense living in Derby, Kansas. I really think the number one though you hit on it should be like no team should have like natural disasters in their name. No. I mean, when you really think about it, it's it's fucking terrible, right? Like the Arizona drought, like it's <laughs> yeah. right. It's, keep even, that one out of there. Even like the Florida Gators, because like I mean, how many people have died because of Gators? Like, yeah, it's just I don't know. It's just I'm okay with I'm okay with pretty much any animal nickname. The only other ones that I had, uh, Long Beach State dirt bags. But the more I think about it, it's kind of <laughs> funny. There's a lot of which okay. NFL, NBA, baseball, hockey. Who do you think has the worst names overall? Oof. Well, just on the top, just on the top of my head, I'm going to say hockey has the best. Yeah, I would agree. Hockey has the best. Uh, NBA probably has the dumbest. Um, some of them aren't great. Like yeah, like, actually, I can't think of any good NBA ones. Like the Atlanta Hawks, like they're Hawks in Atlanta. Are, are there Hawks in Atlanta? You know, I mean, just the Denver Nuggets. I mean, I guess after the Gold Rush, but I would think that would be like the Golden State Nuggets instead of the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, you can't have two different light, right? Like, how are the Denver Nuggets and the San Francisco Forty ers Like, who's getting the Gold Rush teams? You can't be two yeah. places. Yeah, and then like you know, like the pit, like like the NFL is probably second. Like the Pittsburgh Steelers is good, 
You know, but like the Detroit Lions, there are no Lions in Detroit. At the same point, it's all a marketing ploy anyways. No no one, you know, these teams don't name these clubs based upon anything, really. Um, you know, thank God the Houston Oilers are gone. 